I'm going to talk briefly on uh, the subject of, of digital toys and looking slightly beyond the games itself, looking more towards perhaps play uh, and less um, towards the actual part of, of winning and th that those two concepts don't necessarily have to be as intertwined as maybe they are in, in common perception. Um, I work at a, a game studio or a, or a play studio called Tokaboka, um, which uh, started earlier this year. I founded it together with uh, a colleague of mine who's also here called Emil Uvemar. Um, and what we do is, is we make digital toys for touchscreen devices. Like this is the one, one of them that we can see on the, on the side. Um, what I was going to share with you is the research that led us to that point. You know, how did we end up making these types of products and, and in what way do we did we think and, and sort of what do we look at when we were designing these products? That's where this, this material comes from. Um, first thing is to sort of define that toys and games are not the same thing. They are, they are intrinsically different. And um, it might not be super obvious where that line goes, and I guess there are a few sort of shady, shady areas too, but in, in general there's, there's a few pointers which always leads us in the right direction when wondering if it's one or the other. Um, this is a good example of a toy, which actually is the same project. I don't know if you, when you saw Paolo Antonelli, at the end of it, it said, sort of, talk to me. You saw this big picture. This is actually the same product. It's called Talking Carl. Going to mom and daddy, right? Going to mom and daddy, right? Oh. Huh? Oh. Oh. You can sort of see where this is going. Uh, <laughs> um, what's fun about Talking Carl is that you can't win. There's no way of winning at it. it it's, it's fun. Uh, it's something that you play with. It uh, simply repeats um, whatever you say in a funny voice. There are several clones around that too. But it sort of leads us to think that everything that's, that's fun is not necessarily a game. It can just be a toy, just like a, a, a frisbee or a, um, a hula hoop for that matter. You can turn it into a game if you want to, but it's fun just playing around as it is. Um, so this sort of, this, this idea of where this defining line is sort of led us to starting to look at more, well, where can we go beyond games? And how have toys been designed in a physical world to try to think where we could take that and then shift that into a digital perspective? So how are they designed? Um, there's a lot of interesting thinkers going on in this area. Um, IDEO has a toy lab, MIT has a toy lab. Um, just sort of thinking about the design of toys. So we looked. Uh, one of the things that we looked at was the blockbuster toy, which is sort of the, you know, the great successful toys that come from, um, well, all all through history more or less. Um, and one of the things that we noticed through that that blockbuster toys often created new categories, introduced new ways of thinking about toys, or provided new approaches of marketing it. So these are the blockbuster toys, sort of the super successful toys, um, from the 1900s and up until the 2000s. Uh, there are things that you might recognize, like Mickey Mouse from 1930, Monopoly from 1934, uh, Frisbee Disc, 1958, uh, Rubik's Cube, 1977, things that are still uh, very much a, a part of, of modern-day culture, too. A few things have changed slightly, then there are minor adaptions, but more or less there are things that, that really take in the test of time. And it's interesting to sort of dive into to see how have they been designed and crafted and what type of attributes do these products have to make them or give them this longevity. Um, and I thought to sort of dive into one more specifically and sort of see how that worked is the uh, 1989 blockbuster toy, or one of the two at least. Super Soku was one of them, Batman another, but we're going to dive into and look at Game Boys. 